Romans chapter 8, I'll pick it up in verse 31. We're looking at now part two of our message titled, What Are You Going to Do About Bible Prophecy? And I know what you're thinking. How on earth can you look at Romans 8 and think of Bible prophecy? Well, normally we wouldn't, but it appears that we're so close to meeting Jesus that it all applies to the imminent now. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but deliver him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Awesome. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Don't you just want to... Stay in that verse. We'll get to it eventually. <laughs> nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My goodness, we could read that portion of scripture as we have and go home. There's enough there to satisfy us. That, uh, those are God's words to the soul of any man, woman, boy, or girl who's looking unto God for an answer for the existence, for the purpose of life, and not only that, but life eternal. Eternal life. God has promised us. And he answers that deep longing down inside that everybody has. If you had admitted it or not, down deep inside, you're wondering, is there life after death? It's in, it's in the heart. God has announced that he's placed eternity in our hearts, and that's why we ask that question of us. And I want to encourage all of you who are believers, those of you who have unbelieving friends, they've got the same question, they just won't admit it. They're wondering about, is there life after death? They're wondering about, can I be forgiven of my sins if God exists? And then they lay their head down at night, and I'm convinced of this, that there's a little bit of a tapping going on on their soul. And God is saying to them, I do exist. He might even be saying things like, you need my son. God is speaking. By way of both introduction and review, we're asking this question, what are you going to do about Bible prophecy? Because what we're looking at is the ultimate fulfillment of the ultimate prophecy. Is that God would send forth his son. And you guys know this, that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first prophetic what's known as an eschatological, listen, eschatological, soteriological. So those are big words. Yes, they're big words with the proper meanings. Future announcement made by God that he would send salvation. Soteriology is the study of the salvation doctrine of God in the Bible. Eschatology is the fact that God alone tells the future in advance. And the number one message of Bible prophecy is the salvation of mankind found in Genesis 3.15. But you can build upon that great assurance. Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus said, when answered concerning the last days and the end times, Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you. That's going to be the number one issue of the last day's events is deception coming against the world and coming against the believer. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in the latter times, I'm going to ask you if you think you believe in these days or not. I do. In the latter times, shall, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. I think that explains a lot today. 
speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That's an amazing statement because it means that there's going to be people living in the last days who are living for evil to such a degree and a commitment that they can't even feel any longer the conviction of God. They have put themselves in a place of such evil that what they think is actually good. They think it's so good that they think you agree. Their conscience have been seared. Do we live in a time like that? All the more reason why we need to be ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ as we're in these days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Again, this is all introductory to where we're going. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And you guys know the word perilous means days that will wear you down like a carpenter's plane as they just use that planer to make that log eventually into a toothpick. <laughs> and the floor is covered with all these little curled up shavings of, of wood. The Bible says the last days are going to be like that. They're just going to take one layer on you after another. But thank God that's not true for the believer if you're not a believer in Christ today, you're suffering that right now. You're being peeled back. For the believer, we're being reminded. And we're actually being strengthened by this. And he goes on in verse 2, For men will be lovers of themselves. True or false, church? How about this? Lovers of money. True or false? Boasters. True again. Proud. We don't need to say anything about that one. Blasphemers. Wow. Disobedient to parents? All God's parents here said amen to that. <laughs> Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving slanders. True. Without self-control. Brutal. Despisers of good. Sounds like the streets of our cities in America today. Traitors. Headstrong. Haughty. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, this is shocking. Having a form of godliness, that means they look like believers on the outside, but they deny its power. That's a reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, listen, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to send out the word of God into the hearts of all those who will listen. When the Bible here tells us that they deny its power, they're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit using the word of God, they deny its power. From such people turn away. Did you know that, friends? Listen, you're not to have fellowship with those who practice in the unfruitful works of darkness, the Bible says. Now, there's an interesting thing here that's not part of our study, but just keep this in mind. You and I have friends who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be wrong for us to go out and carry on with their escapades. That's, that's forbidden by us. But it doesn't mean that we don't have fellowship with them in the sense of, I, by fellowship I mean not spiritual fellowship, but if they uh, invite us over uh, to watch, oh, I don't know, hmm, the Super Bowl, um, that, that you might go. You might go, and you would be a witness. You'd be an example. You would not compromise, but they might love you in their way, and you love them, and your whole intent is to win them the Christ, and you're watching uh, San Francisco decimate uh, the Chiefs, and... Um, I, I hope that was prophetic. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, the, the point is, is that you want to lead them out of darkness into light. But, you, but listen, you would never condone the sin that they're involved in. They know, if you love them, they know that you do not approve of how they live. And you love them enough to say what you're doing is wrong. That's my love to you. And... Um, this is a vital thing. But watch this. When it comes to the church, those who claim to believe in Christ, or maybe they do and they're in a backslidden state, for them to ask you and I to go fellowship with them in their situation. Do you know what the Bible says about that? Very different thing. The Bible says concerning a brother or a sister who's living in sin that you are not even supposed to eat with them. Isn't that interesting? Think about that, because look, in the world, let's say your company invites you to a corporate lunch. You are going to be eating with sinners. 
and you'd be the best witness. But if your backslidden friends say, hey, come on down to Joe's Bar and Grill and let's have some pizza and ribs together, you're supposed to say to them, listen, you guys know that I love you and you know what the scripture says. You're a brother or a sister and you confess Christ and you're not living for Jesus. Listen, brother, I'm not even supposed to eat with you. You know why? Well, that's kind of harsh. Listen, here's why it's harsh is because that's God speaking to the believer that's backslidden that as you and I live out not eating with them, the fact of the matter is God's not eating with them either. They need to get back home like the prodigal son. So we have fellowship in a sense with this world, but we're not of this world. But we're not to have fellowship with those who name the name of Christ when they're living in sin. I hope you, can, I hope you got that one. It's, it's deep. I know. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 tells us, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his coming. I love that. His appearing is when he comes for the church and his coming, when he brings his kingdom, is at the second coming when he establishes his rule from Jerusalem. Preach the word. This is for all of us now, by the way. Not just me, not just other pastors or evangelists, this is for all of us. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come, here we go, here's now, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Wow. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Translation of verse three, the time will come when people don't want to hear what the Bible has to say, but they've got a hankering to be religious and to go to a church on Sunday, so they will find somebody in the pulpit who will tell them stories and antidotes and things that will make them feel better about their wretched life with no transformation whatsoever, pat them on the back, and do it all within 55 minutes so the church experience doesn't disrupt the more important things of their day. And we're living in an age like that. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Tell me another story, Pastor. But you be watchful. Notice that but is in opposition to. Don't be like that. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. And do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Isn't that awesome? So church part one, we looked at this last time, verses 31 to 32, and it is this fact about Bible prophecy. What do we think about it? And we learned in verses 31 to 32 that we learned about the fact that God has a glorification coming to all of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Right now, listen, you've been called by God, by God's foreknowledge. He's predestined you. We'll talk more about this today. And uh, he's, he's got a work going on in your life of sanctification, but ultimately it ends in glorification. And right now, we've not yet been glorified. Watch everybody. Positionally, your name is written down in heaven, and you've been glorified positionally. Are you hearing me? In other words, there's a plaque, as it were, in heaven uh, with, your with, with your seat at a table with your name on it, and that is secured in Christ. That's done. But you and I are not there yet. We're still here. We're in route, and God will see to it that he'll get us there. That's his business. You and I are to cooperate with him. But know this, when that day comes, you'll experience God's promised glorification. We saw that in three ways. That we'll learn the truth about it, Bible doctrine, verse 31. We also learned in verse 31 that we'll see the opposition. We have opposition in this world against us. We have our own selves. Doesn't our flesh fight against what God's doing in our lives? In fact, let's be honest. I've come to this conclusion. There are those out there who can hurt me physically with a sword or a gun, but that's the end of it. That's not much. The biggest problem is me. I'm the one that I can hurt the most. Because if I don't feed the spirit and wind up feeding my flesh instead, then I go to war with me. And Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 7 and 8 as well. And then thirdly, last time we saw in verse 32, that we'll know his favor. 
his favor. Very quickly, this last week has been amazing. I've been uh, throughout Texas and uh, signing, there's been book signings at, at various bookstores for the release of the book and, and um, the publishers had their guys there and there was one gentleman, he, he, with, his, with his, I can't do a Texan accent, so forgive me in advance, but he said, I'm, I'm here to be your bad guy. And I'm thinking, does he have a gun? What's who? And he said, I'm going to make sure people line up and they're getting here and you sign and you get a picture and then move and the line, well, I'm just going to keep the line moving. They're going to be coming, they're going to move them, they're going to come in, they're going to move them. And I said, okay. He goes, so you don't have to be the bad guy. You just stand right there and you do your thing. And here's what's so cool. People started coming up. Hi, Pastor Jack. We watch this. We watch on. We listen to whatever. And you sign the book and you take a picture with them. And the, and the next person says, oh, we're a home away group. And I brought all my friends. Or, you know what, Pastor? I was a truck driver. I learned how to drive a truck drunk. And I was turning the radio and scanning the radio. And your program came on the radio and it was like I was the only one in the world. I had to pull over, and I accepted Christ, and I want you, I think, and, and, and this guy, I, I, and look, I get to hear that all the time, and it's like, that's awesome, brother, that's great, that's great. and this guy's going. <laughs> and so the next person, and the next person, and, and then this happened numerous times. Hi, Pastor Jack, you baptized my four kids, and uh, you did our wedding back in 1892, <laughs> and... And he's, and why am I bringing him up? Because he said, this is none other than the favor of God. And I watched him, I watched him over those days get softer and softer. He was letting people, and he was just, listen. You know what was going on? God was giving testimony to the power of his word. Absolutely amazing. Transformed lives. God's favor. Leads us now into our study today, verses 33 to 34. What are you going to do about Bible prophecy? And it's this. It's the fact that your defense is in God's hands. And everybody said amen to this, right? Amen. Your defense is in God's hands. Amen. Amen. You don't need to defend yourself in this world. You're a child of God. Over and over again, the Bible says you're a child of the living God. Nobody has children that are carrying weapons. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're suited up in spiritual battle armament, right? We've got the armament of Ephesians 6. But when somebody attacks your character or somebody attacks your witness or somebody attacks your home or your family, hear me out. There is a time to stand in what is right. If somebody's attacking your child, need, I don't think I need to say one more word about that. And in doing so, you will be biblical. But if somebody says, you know what, you're a nincompoop, and they stress the word poop, <laughs> let it go. Well, you're this and you're that, let it go. My friend told me that you said, and if it's not true, let it go. Don't get involved in defending yourself. Here is a truth. If you try, Christian, to defend yourself, regarding being a Christian, God's going to let you. You don't want that to happen. What you want to do is do what every three-year-old knows what to do. When they get scared, they go right behind dad's big kneecap and they hang on and they peek out from time to time just to make sure everything's going good. That's how we're to be like a believer, peeking out from time to time as God takes care of us. He's our defense. Verse 33 says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Notice, see, remember last week we talked about how they ask, uh, Paul asks a question and he answers it with a question. It's a Jewish Hebrew way of thinking. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Mark this down if you would, church. Verse 33 teaches us that regarding God being our defense, it all begins in an unlikely area when you and I think about defense, protection, combat, or warfare, and it is this it's innocence. His innocence is now my innocence, yours. You say, well, how are you gonna how are you gonna defend yourself being 
Passive. I didn't say passive. I used the word innocent. His innocence has been imparted to us as believers. This is what it means to be a Christian. I'm convinced now as I look at things around the world and listen to people talk about Christianity, I've come to this conclusion. I just saw an interview the other day on the airplane. I was listening to, um, I don't recommend it. He's got such a foul mouth, but he's of the world. He's lost. The man is lost. He's, he's on his way to hell, but he has the best podcast in the world, and that's Joe Rogan. Don't listen to him. He'll drop every bad word you can imagine, but if you can filter through that, he's not dumb, and he has tremendous hosts on his program, and he had a host who was just bashing Christianity. And I thought to myself, I wish he'd invite me on. I don't need to, I don't need to be on. And God knows that I'm no special witness, but I would like to say, Joe Rogan, you're smarter than this. What are you doing looking at people? People will let you down every time. Why don't you look to God, Joe Rogan? Why don't you look to Jesus Christ who hung on the cross? Why don't you look to what Jesus said and all that he did at the cross? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Joe Rogan, why don't you take a listen to what Jesus says? We get our eyes on people. Listen, we can't experience the innocence of God when we are trying to function in our own, what, righteousness? That's a joke. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Everybody, that's who. But the point demands this. It is God who justifies. In other words, the believer who's justified, nobody can rightfully accuse them. My dear pastor, Chuck Smith, I'm so grateful, you guys. I've had one pastor in my life. People ask me after pa uh, Chuck Smith died, well, who's going to be your pastor now? Excuse me, you don't replace a pastor like Chuck Smith. And I'll just, I'm just going to have to go uh, wait until I see him in heaven. But uh, he's the only pastor I've ever known. You know what he used, he used to say? A lot of great things. But um, one of the things that he would say, among many, is that very thing if you're going to defend yourself rather than God, then he'll just let you do that. So don't make that mistake. But the other thing is this, is that when Christ stands for you, as he does, he's promised, and what Christ imparts to you as a believer, which we scarcely understand as Christians, Christ has imparted to us not only his righteousness, but his innocence, that what matters is what God sees. And he said this. Chuck Smith said this for years, and it's wise stuff. Christian, live your life right before God so that when someone accuses you of something, everybody else will know it's false. Is that great? Live your life in such a way that when somebody says something, they'll know it's wrong. I love that. Innocence. The word who in Greek, it means this. We'll look at it together. There's going to be four words we're going to run down just on the screen. Any certain one, extremely generic. In fact, I like the word, look, the Greek word is tss. Like tss. Who? Tss. Anyone, someone, anyone in a generic sense, which encompasses all, any, one or the many, a mob or group. Excuse me, how about all of them? Any one of them, the entire lot. All of humanity cannot bring a charge against you if you're in Christ. It's a positional statement made by God to us. Do you and I sin? Yes, we do. Do we hate it now? Yes, we do. Do we live to sin? No, we do not. We live for Christ. But when we sin, if somebody comes up and says to us, you shouldn't have done that, you know what our response is? You are 100% correct. Listen, if, dad, mom, if you lose it in your home and your bowling words come out of your mouth and your, your son heard that and they said, what was that? You need to say to them, son, that was absolute sin coming out of the old me. Jesus died for that on the cross and I repent of it right now, son. That was how your dad used to be or how your mom used to be 
Or, son, that's how your mom used to be. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a moment to redeem. Don't listen. The human habit is to pick up the carpet and sweep it under. Don't do it. The redemptive motive and moment is to say to your son, what I said was wrong. It's an offense to God. It offended you and it makes me sick. I ask you, son, to forgive me. In fact, Lord, you would grab your boy and you'd say, Lord, forgive me for what just came up. I should not have used that word. And I'm, Lord, forgive me. And then turn to your son and say, listen, son, never forget. God is always listening. And he's not always listening to give us a smack. He's always listening to give us deliverance. Go to him, son. Don't teach our kids to bury it under. There'll never be healing. You'll never have a decent relationship. Things will be messed up all your life if you're just a barrier. What, what's, uh, what's the term? A stuffer. You just stuff it. Hide it. Bury it. Act like it's never going to come back up. Don't want to talk about it. It's human nature to do that. It's my nature. It's your nature. But inevitably, God will bring it to the surface. And when it does, it's a, it's a, it's a bloody time. It's a, what I would call a, a, it's a vomitous moment. Your guts will come out. God will see to it. The next word is bring. Who shall bring? Who are these people? Who shall bring? To bring, in, infl- to inflict, to bring harassment, to make pronouncements against. Who shall bring? Who are they? Well, it's one person and the entire mob. What do they do? They bring against you indictments and harassment. Accusations. How many of you, I've heard it, I hear it all the time. How many of you now have gotten serious about Jesus Christ so your family, they don't like the new you? You're a 21st century Jesus freak. Everything you talk about is Jesus, and they can't stand you for it. They hate to see you coming. Did you know that? They're hoping you do not show up to the Super Bowl today <laughs> because there he comes. He's going to talk about, uh, he's going to say, let's pray for all of the players that nobody gets hurt. <laughs> Something. They're all been out of shape because now you operate in a totally different world. And God is saying to you, who can bring an indictment against you? The Bible means nobody. And then the word charge. Look at the word charge. It's a banking term, but not like you think. Not like, you know, racking up, uh, like I'm going to send you a bill, but it's close. Listen to this. A banking term meaning to call in or to call on a loan or to call upon a loan. If you have a loan with somebody, your bank, remember when you signed the, the documents to that thing, you, whatever you did, and the bank was involved? It's really quiet in here right now. If you're borrowing money from a bank to buy that house, did you know that that bank and the fine print that you didn't take the time to read says that at any time it can call your loan and you've got 30 days to pay what is owed to the bank or the house is theirs or the car is theirs or the property. It's theirs to call the loan. Who shall bring any indictment against you in the sense of calling the loan. You've got to pay up now, the world will say. Isn't that how the world operates? We want this now. We want this from you now. Listen, God doesn't work this way. It means this. The banking term meaning to call in a loan or to demand sudden payment of debt, to bring forth the ledger of what is owed. The world says you owe me this and I'm going to take a pound of your flesh until I get it. Not for the Christian. We're talking about the entrance into heaven. We're talking about eternal life. The Bank of America may call your loan. Listen, God will never call your loan because God's not in the business of loaning. Did you know that? For God so loved the world that he... He didn't loan his son to you. He gave his son to you. He gifted. And then the word elect, favored one, chosen one, selected one. That's who you are. 
A lot of people want to argue about the doctrine of election. We covered this a few weeks ago. It's all based on God's foreknowledge. Based on God's foreknowledge, he predestines. You want to figure that out, do you? You want to write a book about it? You want to form a denomination over it? Knock yourself out. Why don't you just enjoy it? God knows those who are his kids. Don't you know who your kids are? You better, after the end of this service, you better take your kids home. (laughs) Not somebody else's kids or no kids, your kids. If you know your kids, God knows his kids. And the Bible tells us that his foreknowledge is all based on love. Isn't that amazing? The elect. And we're going to go in a direction here that I hope uh, blesses you in the sense that it's It stays in line with our theme of it being prophetic, this beautiful doctrine here in Romans. But I want to read you this quote. It's a good one. I don't normally uh, quote John Stott, but this was a good quote. Here, Paul challenges anybody, everybody, or anything in heaven, listen, earth or hell, to answer these theological assertions. To deny them is to deny the truth which they contain. But there is no answer. In other words, there's silence. For no one, nothing, nor anything can harm the people of God whom he has foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. That's a good statement. That is comforting. That is a beautiful truth. So notice here with me that the election of God's people is not an assumption. It's not whimsical, but it's based on the foreknowledge of God. It's not based, listen, some of you are going to be liberated in a moment by this statement. It's not based upon some church or denominational belief. This might even get any more liberating. It's this. It's not based on some sort of hierarchical decision or election based on you. Well, the council has voted and you can be a member. Oh, well, thank you. I thought the blood of Jesus Christ was enough. It's not based on a committee. The committee has concluded you're not acceptable. Andrew Bonar, one of the great preachers of yesteryear, was candidating for a great pulpit. It might have been uh, even in Oxford itself. I don't remember, but it's a biggie. Cambridge, Oxford, And he was rejected. And so he wrote to his dad. His dad was praying for him. And he wrote to his dad, rejected. He was all depressed. His father wrote him back, rejected on earth, accepted in heaven. And you got to remember, all of us should remember that type of thinking. That's that's right on. It's not a man-made election. Thank God for that. It's God's election. So there's people who are hyper-Calvinists, Calvinistic, 4.9ers, 4.3, 3.7, whatever. Listen, I'm not going to argue about it. Just not going to argue about it. I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus said and did. Well, how do you know you're going to go to heaven? Because he said so. Well, how do you know for sure? Because he said if anyone who would come to him repenting of their sins and believing him would not perish but have everlasting life I'm so happy about that God keeps his word and the great thing is they get all upset they get all bent out of shape you, want to, you know why they get all bent out of shape because they're not sure about themselves and when they meet somebody who's sure it really bothers them so they don't know what to do and then they say no I don't think you're, I don't think you're going to go why because I believe in what God says God's able to perform yeah me and Abraham we're in this together where are you at And they'll mention the doctrines of man. They'll mention the achievements of man. There's only one achievement of a man, and it's the man, God, Christ Jesus. That's where you hang your head. It's not your church, friends, that says to you, if you go through these sacraments, if you have these experiences, if you go and do, dot all of the I's, cross all of the T's, 
say a half a dozen of these and a quarter dozen of the other. And this offends people. The reason why I'm saying this is because I said this a couple weeks ago and I got some hot mail. <laughs> and you know what? I, I'm, actually, I'm actually protecting the guilty by not showing their email on the screen right now. Their email lambasted me this way. My church says this, my church says this, my priests say this, the Pope says the, this, the po- and you don't, if they say that, you can't be right, no matter, that verse, that verse has got to mean something else other than you said, you're teaching false because the Bible can't say that. Let the Bible speak for itself. And, um, and see, I just gave you, see, you're now you, somebody watching right now, Or maybe you're here and you're going, I can't take that. I'm going to write you a hot mail. And uh, (laughs) go right ahead. Here's the deal. If you've got to defend your church, if you have to defend anything, excuse me, my friend, our God defends us. You think he needs our defense? Oh, Jack, will you put in a good word for me today? If that's the kind of God we serve, I'm out. God is God with or without me. Heaven is holy with or without me. He doesn't need us. He allows us. And in his love, in his nature, he has elected his children based upon foreknowledge. It means God can't learn anything. He knows it all from start to finish on our timeline. So I want to read this to you. The elect of God. So I don't know if it's on the screen or not, but I'll read it to you. Is it on the screen? Not? No, no. So the elect of God are all those, either Jew or Gentile, having come to Christ. That's the elect of God. Please write this down. Some of you who understand or you think you understand Bible prophecy, make sure you write this down. The elect of God are all those who have put their faith in Christ. So if you're in a theological course right now at some seminary, I'm going to ask you this question. Don't answer so quickly. But the answer, if I were to ask you, is, is, was Noah elect of God? Was David elect of God? The answer is yes. So said, well, yeah, but those were Old Testament saints. Exactly. The nature of God and his election doesn't change. So what makes you say that? Have you ever heard of two guys called Jacob and Esau? Yeah. The election of God. Have you ever heard two guys by the name of Cain and Abel? The election of God. Were they not, listen, the the bad boys, were they not told to do good by God? Yes, they chose to do bad, didn't they? Interesting thought. So let me ask you something. Doesn't the Bible teach that you and I now are as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are the elect of God? What about the tribulation saints, those that are going to be in the future saved during the seven-year tribulation period? Are they the elect of God? Oh, not only are they the elect of God, read your Bible carefully because you've got two versions, not two versions, you've got two representations of those being elect by the same God to the same Christ and for the same salvation, but there's a group that's Gentile during the seven-year tribulation period, and there's a vast group that is Jewish. In fact, how do the Gentiles become believers in Yeshua HaMashiach? Jesus as Messiah. How does the Gentiles during the tribulation period become followers of Jesus by the Jewish evangelist in the seven-year tribulation period? The elect of God is in every generation until time ends. Remember that. What you are as the church is the bride of Christ. Again, elect, but we're not the saints of the Old Testament and we're not the saints of the tribulation period. We are the saints or the church or the bride of Christ. Big difference in this area. Our lives, we have been promised to Jesus as a bride. That's not, are you listening? That's not true of the Old Testament and it's not true of the tribulation saints. That's why the tribulation saints and the Old Testament saints get white robes in eternity, not the church. Did you know that? The church doesn't get white robes. She gets fine linen, clean and bright. It's a wedding gown. 
It's different. So technically, just at the top of your page, there's three categories of saints, if you would want to sum it up. Old Testament, church age, tribulation saints. Ephesians, are you guys okay? Yes. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Is that great? Man, that's, that's one sentence. That is deep. Just as he chose us in him, that's Christ, before the foundation of the world, foreknowledge, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Isn't that great? God wants you in heaven. He thinks it's a great idea to have you with us. to the praise and to the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Wow. That's a liberating passage. There's many times when I'm sitting in my office and I also carry these in my truck where I have a pen nearby and just God prompts my heart that, you know, this, this person needs this verse. So many times in biblical guidance, I'm listening. Because, you know, you listen. You listen. And they're talking. And you write that, you're writing down answers. And the answers are the scriptures. So at the end, I want to show you what I give to people. This, <laughs> I've been doing this for almost 30 years. So I write your name on there. I put the date on there. And see the RX, the prescription? I write the verses down, or I write, I write those passages down. Uh, I like how it says, do not substitute. Because, you know, your medications say that. Don't substitute. Well, if it's important for a doctor to make sure you don't substitute your medicine, you shouldn't substitute the Bible for some other spiritual mambo-jambo somewhere, some Jiminy Cricket theology. And then at the bottom it says, to ensure effectiveness, use only the word of God. All scriptures guaranteed. It's your responsibility to take your medicine. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 11. <laughs> that says God's word will not return void. So I, again, I just write these. Pastor, can you write me a prescription? Oh, I, I just write them like nothing. Like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> because you're going to get Bible verses on that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is God's work. He's defending you. And all that concerns you, he defends you. John chapter 6, verse 43. John 6, 43 says, Jesus therefore answered and said to them, they were having a debate, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Did you know that? Did you know that if you want to come to Jesus Christ, it's because the Father's been working in your life and you didn't even know it. That moment when you say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to become a Christ follower. The Bible says that that is true because God has been wooing you. The pilgrim uh, Puritans used to call that the wooing of the Holy Spirit. He's flirting with you to come to Christ. Dropping, as it were, we would say breadcrumbs to get you closer. This is kind of corny, but not for me. We have a lot of squirrels in our backyard and front yard, and I, I have peanuts, and I set them up in such a way because I'm, I'm trying to get them to eat out of my hand. Now, they're just too spoiled, by the way. They, they know they can get peanuts without eating out of my hand because I'm just so abounding in grace and mercy with the nuts. They don't have to work for it. So I'm thinking about cutting, cutting them back, getting them desperate. So why? Because I just want to get close. They're so cute. And I'm not talking, I'm talking the big bushy tail. They're awesome. And the ones that we have here in Southern California, they got, they got the red bellies with the brown back. They're gorgeous. And I just, I mean, I'm not going to, I just want to touch them. And you can talk to them. They'll turn their head. And you don't like, they'll go... It's so fun, and I'm like, take it, take it, 
take the peanut, take the peanut. <laughs> I just want to like, God is saying, here, there you go. Mm-hmm. That's it. Come on. Here, take it. Take it. I just, I just want to grab you and scoop you away from this dangerous world. I just want to grab you and hold, I just want to get you close. If we can be like that to a bird or a squirrel or a, I don't know what, why can't God be like that? Is that some distant, ancient, effervescent of what we once were in Christ, created in the image of God, that all God wants to do is to get you near into him? I think so. And Jesus said, my father will draw you to me. Galatians 5 verse 5 says, for through the spirit, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That's a rapture verse, by the way. Theologians write it down. You can go argue with yourself all night long on this one. Go study it. It's beautiful. For we through the spirit eagerly wait. Guess what? See the two words eagerly wait? It means imminent. Any time, any moment, without warning. That's why we eagerly wait. There's no sign, no signal. It could happen today. What? The hope of righteousness by faith. The hope of righteousness is the complete fulfillment of all that God has promised to finish in your life, and that will happen at the moment of your death or rapture. Think of that. Beautiful. Wonderful. Um, all this is true because of his justifying work. I want to run through these. I don't know if they're going to be on the screen or not. It doesn't matter, but just listen to this. And if they're not on the screen, just close your eyes and let this hit you uh, right in the heart. Who are the elect of God? People always want it. Well, who are they? Well, this is what, this has been my experience. The elect of God are those found in big corner offices. The elect of God are those that are found in classrooms. The elect of God are those that are found on the battlefield. The elect of God are those that are found in the darkened haunts of our world. The elect of God are those who are on the streets. You ever think about that? The elect of God are those who are in poverty. The elect of God are those who are being trafficked. Technically, the elect of God could even be those who are doing the trafficking. They haven't heard the gospel yet, or maybe they haven't understood it. The elect of God are those who are found in their wealth and in their fame. I think you get where I'm going with this. We are commanded to tell the world about Jesus, and we are not to be influenced in any way, shape, or form by the circumstances that surround that soul. If there's a man, woman, boy, or girl that's caught up into something, are we not commanded to go rescue them? The world hates us for this. You want to love Jesus? Yes, I do. Then get ready to be hated. Because if you love Jesus, Jesus is going to send you to get out after the souls of men and women, boys and girls. To tell them that God loves them and God wants to forgive them and give them a whole new life. Don't be fooled by the corner office. I say corner office because I, you, many of you already know the story. I won't say it again, but... I shared the gospel at a glo I worked for a massive global corporation, and in our region, there was the corner office. And um, nobody was around at that moment. It was the corporate picnic outdoors, and I saw the president sitting at his desk. And his door was open, and his secretary, who guarded his door, was not there. And I walked into, well, I didn't walk into his office. I walked up to his office. You know you're going into a serious place when the carpet changes its level by about two inches. It's like, and I just went. And long story short, I shared the gospel with him, trembling. And he's just sitting there like this. I mean, it's just me in, in the lion's den. And then when I got all done, he said, are you done? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, I'm a born-again believer, too. I love Jesus with all. And it's like. 
So when I say corner office, we can be intimidated. I can't tell them. Yeah, yeah you can. Well, but they're poor. They might, they might have a disease. They might, they're dirty. Well, you know what? We can see their situation on their skin. Some are seen only inside the heart. Well, I'm not going to talk to that person. That person is a LMNOP, GMY, uh, QR code, something. <laughs> but wait a minute. Without, there go you and I, but for the grace of God. Amen. You might be asking the question, I mean, how do I do this? How can I be involved in God's work like this? Well, listen, first of all, the power of proclaiming the gospel, my friend, of Jesus Christ throws supernatural light into the atmosphere, into the situation. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, So he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord, and he's quoting Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Isn't that wild? Isaiah 61 has the word gospel in Hebrew. My Jewish friends. To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, Jesus. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That had to freak him out. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. That's how we're supposed to share Christ. Regarding the election of God and this topic we're talking about right now is the fact that in Romans 10, verse 14, the Bible says, How then shall they call upon him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher, a messenger? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, Isaiah 52 verse 7 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. There it is, again. Of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. Isn't that awesome? You guys okay? Yeah. Almost done. Luke 14. Then Jesus said to him, A certain man, speaks a parable, gave a great supper and invited many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all is now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. What kind of a nut buys some land without seeing it first? That's a lame excuse. Verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to go test them. I ask you to have me excused. Nobody, nobody buys a car without test driving it. This guy bought five ox, five oxen. Like, it's like buying oxen on the internet. And you go, and then, then they arrive, and they don't have legs. <laughs> you test them first. Jesus is giving the excuses that people give. Why don't you become a Christian today? Uh, it's the Super Bowl. <laughs> Why don't you become a Christian today? Uh, every excuse we have is lame. Every one of them. This, this, now this guy, let's see him. He, he might have something here. <laughs> Still another said, I married a wife, therefore I can't come. <laughs> Look! <laughs> Would love to follow you, Jesus, but... I just married, married a wife, and I, I'm not quite sure what I can do today, <laughs> but I'm pretty certain that I can't come. By the way, man, that's no excuse. You, you have to choose Christ. 
So that servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house, being angry, the word, is, the word angry is being provoked by disappointment. I got all this food. I set up everything. Got an amazing light and sound system. Infinite amount of food here for these people. Went through all this trouble and they don't want to come. That hurts. So he said to his servant, go out, listen to this. By the way, I'm, I'm in verse 21. Go out into the streets and to the lanes of the city and bring here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there's room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways, into the hedges. This is God's heart for you. And compel them to come, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. Don't reject his offering. Don't do it. We're not going to get even close to being done. Which doesn't surprise any of you. We have to end at this. You know, how has God, stop for a moment, how has God been inviting you in life? Some of you might say, we hear it all the time. I heard it this last week. I stopped going to church because my mom died. I heard this this week. I stopped going to church in 2020 because my husband died of COVID. And I stopped going to church. You know, listen to me. I stopped going to church because my son died at the age of four. Stopped going to church. I turned my back on God because, fill in the blank. What, what are you actually saying? What are, what are we saying when we say such things? This is what we're saying without saying it. God's word told me about this kind of stuff. God's word prepares people for this kind of stuff. But either I wasn't paying attention or I didn't believe it, but here's, the, here's usually the big one. I never thought it happened to me. Isn't that funny about us? We are God's children. We are his elect. And you think for a moment, I think for a moment, I'm going to escape the difficulties of this world? What, what gives you that right? Do you not understand that the Bible teaches that it is actually more beneficial for you and I to go through those perils for our own eternal good and also to become a minister of those who in life go through those very same things. Yes, exactly. And here's what we're saying. I don't care. I don't care about ministering to others who are, go, who are going to go through what I'm going through. I don't like the way this is going. God ripped me off and I'm going to turn my back on him. And you may not say it, but a lot of people live it. There's the atheist that shakes his fist at God and says, you don't exist, which is always hilarious. I got it. I told you, it's even heating up. I got in trouble. I am in trouble. You're looking at a man in trouble. <laughs> when I prayed in Congress, I think I told you guys the story. I prayed, prayed in Congress. I, had, uh, I was blessed by uh, House Speaker Mike. Johnson asked me to pray in Congress. I went and prayed, and uh, I, in the first sentence, I broke seven rules. And, uh, and, and so it turns out that the national, uh, the national Atheist Party or something, uh, the Freedom From Religion Organization, is furious because I mentioned God the Father, that's gender insensitive, I didn't know that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's a religious figure, you cannot proselytize, that he was crucified for our sins, that's judgmental, and that he rose again from the dead, that's unsettling. <laughs> and then in the prayer I said, I, sh I should have just prayed the prayer, it was faster than me telling you about it right now. I just said everybody who uh, makes decisions in this house, Lord, remind them that they're going to be responsible for the decisions that they make before they 
stand before you, the great judge of the universe. So I'm in trouble. Listen, if that's in trouble, then let me be in trouble like that every day. But listen, when, when things don't go our way, and then we want to say, uh, where's God in all this? I thought he loved me. Oh, he loves you like you can't believe. Well, I thought good things would happen to me because I'm a follower of Jesus now. You didn't get that out of the Bible. <laughs> Everybody's got trouble. The difference for us is that he walks with us all the way through. And then, then he walks, listen, then he walks us through and he turns us around and he says, what, watch what happens. You think, that, you think all that pain? Might I remind you, Jack, all the pain that you suffered through that, was I not with you along the way? Yes, sir. Did I not say while you were reading passages to find comfort that I even store your tears in my bottle? Yes, sir. Well, then watch the results from what you just went through. And then you watch and you see you didn't know that your neighbor that you were witnessing to would never listen to a word you said but they saw you go through the suffering. And God shows you that. I'm, I'm working. I'm speaking through your pain. Then God says, you know, see that grandchild that you couldn't reach? You've been doing, or your son or your daughter. You told them the gospel so many times that they could preach it back to you, yet they don't believe it. Watch what happens from your suffering because they were watching the whole time. Christian, you can stand, but quietly, please, I want to ask you this question. We're talking about Bible prophecy here in the book of Romans 8. Are you willing? Don't even raise your hand right now. But if I were to ask you, are you a Christian? Hands would go up. I found out in Texas, everybody's a Christian. <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah. Satan on Sunday is a Christian. Everybody's a Christian. You may raise your hand, that doesn't make you a Christian. I might say to you, are you trusting Christ? You say, I'm trusting Christ. Do you understand? It actually means nothing to say it. You have to live it. And so, if I were to ask you, do you want to live your life for the glory of God? Listen, in a moment of enthusiasm, you might say, yes! You're actually saying, Lord, I want to live my life for you. You being God, me being your servant, fulfill your prophetic plan for my life that you have. Don't let me get in the way. And what if God says, I'm glad to hear that because the cancer that's going to come to your life in this world, I may not send you cancer, Jack. I may not give you a brain tumor, Susie or whoever, but I'm going to use it to reach more people than you could have ever reached if you were healthy and whole. And by your suffering and eventual death, like a grain of seed that falls into the ground and only lives by itself, but if it falls into the ground, it dies. It brings forth much fruit. I'm going to take your suffering and your death and bring around out of your witness hundreds of people coming to Christ. You'll see them in heaven. You and I as Christians are to say to that, yes, sir. Yes, sir. To deny that is to miss out on his perfect will for your life. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, how about this? In Jesus' name, if there's any area of our lives as believers that are not yielded, if that's just a little too much for somebody to hear, we will admit this. How about this? Lord, if we're not willing, will you make us willing? If my heart, if our hearts are not yielded, if we're not right with you today, God, make us right with you. If I've got the wrong attitude about my suffering right now, I'm, I'm inviting you to change my attitude. Church family, as we, end this, as we end in this song, will you give to him that which is ailing you right now? Let's make this our prayer to his glory.